Thank you. So, well, it's certainly intimidating to be here in front of all of these brilliant minds and following up on these really insightful, beautiful talks. Um, but Claudia said I should have fun, so I'm going to try to at least have fun today. Um, without a doubt, AI has brought us wonderful tools. So um, when you type a query into Google, you'll get a very intelligent answer powered by a very sophisticated AI engine. Nowadays, we can talk into our phones, which wasn't really possible 10 years ago, at least the part that your phone actually understood what you say, and you can almost instantaneously translate it into another language. We now have real-time video analysis where you can segment the objects and classify them and actually have real scene understanding. And of course, recently, um, and also uh, featured in the previous talk, uh, DeepMind actually solved more or less the problem of protein folding by giving us input, a sequence of amino acids, and then predicting the 3D shape of that protein. Um, but there's much more on the horizon. There's promise of self-driving cars, or maybe actually self-flying cars. There's going to be autonomous agriculture and self-regulating greenhouses. There's going to be much more sophisticated robots that can walk like humans. There's intelligent chatbots that can actually maintain a conversation, like you're really talking to a person. And there might be automated chip design that can sort of keep uh, Moore's law going. Now, of course, the greatest promise of all that we've discussed here today um, is artificial general intelligence, what it precisely means, uh, let alone. But um, let me say, at least my view on this, or my, my belief, perhaps, is, is more appropriate. Intelligence really has many, many manifestations. And human intelligence is just one of them. Now, the fact that we are here is basically an existence proof that in the long run, we will be able to build it out of you know, artificial components as well. And that immediately implies that such an artificial intelligence will experience free will. It will be creative. And it will at, at least experience consciousness, or it, it, it can experience consciousness. Now, I think we, do need, we don't need any new fundamental laws uh, to discover in order to understand intelligence. So sorry for those particle physics, physicists here at CERN, we really don't need any more particles to understand intelligence. What we do need is to understand how intelligence emerges out of complexity, how neural information processing systems will eventually produce int artificial intelligence. And another important part of that is probably embodiment. We want to put that complex brain into a body so that it can interact with the world around it. So how do we reach AI? So we may not need more fundamental laws, but we certainly need better AI and smarter machine learning algorithms. It turns out there's two camps in our field. There's the camp that says, we need to scale this all up. More data, more compute, bigger models. And the biggest models nowadays have over a trillion parameters. There's the other camp that basically argues for something like the opposite, saying, no, 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 we need to be smarter about this. We need to inject inductive biases into our system. The laws of physics, laws of sociology and psychology, causality. We need to inject common knowledge in terms of maybe knowledge graphs. And we need to be able to reason with those symbols that we create that way. Now, that Many of these actually come down to the fact that we can actually simulate the world around us. And to make this a little bit more interactive, I want to do a little sort of game, and I want to ask you to imagine a blue elephant on a unicycle cycling on the moon. I think nobody has any trouble doing this. Yet, there will never be a blue elephant cycling on a unicycle on the moon. And when I ask you, okay, now the, the, the elephant reaches the, the, uh, the drop, a big drop into a crater, you can see the poor elephant tumble down and fall off of his, uh, his chair, his unicycle. So we have the ability not just to simulate the world, we have the ability to manipulate it and you know, predict its consequences, 
And even better, we can do this, we can generalize this to situations that will never ever happen. I think that's very powerful and that's what we need for intelligence. So another important part is if we are going to build intelligence, we really need to make sure it will benefit humanity and society. It needs to be fair, that means non-discriminatory. It needs to be transparent, it should be able to explain itself. It needs to be uncountable and certifiable. It needs to be confidential, respect our privacy. And it needs to be collaborative, we need to be able to interact with it and help us. Many people, also in the previous talks, worry about AI that could actually end humanity. Now, I'm not going to say that that's not going to happen. I mean, yes, this is a good topic to study, and it, it might happen, in my opinion, in the very far future. Not that we get destro destroyed, but at least that we can create something that is equally powerful as a human. But it's not something that I am w waking over every night. And the reason is that I think there are more urgent and imminent dangers to humanity that are common from humanity itself and where AI can actually pay, play an important role in solving it. And I personally find it more interesting to think about that. And of course, I'm talking about climate change. So I predict that the next disruption is not going to be that we are going to build AGI. I think the next disruption is, maybe a little more modest, that we're going to understand matter and life much better at the molecular scale. And the applications that can come out of that are really wonderful. We can probably design new drugs on demand. We can build hydrogen-based energy batteries. We can design room temperature superconductivity. We can build or design green fertilizers and biodegradable materials such as plastics. So I believe this is a very worthy topic, topic. And I actually believe that we are on the verge of making big breakthroughs in this particular domain. There's a number of things that are coming together, namely in the sciences are improving fast, condensed matter physics, computational chemistry, and molecular biology. Um, it, it starts to collide and converge with a number of really important modeling and computing paradigms, such as computational science, cloud computing, machine learning, and quantum computing. And then I already talked about the you know, the applications which will drive sort of injection of finance, of, uh, of uh, budget into that. Now, humanity, two and a half million years ago, humanity started to use stones to build tools. That was the Stone Age. It was followed by the Bronze Age and then the Iron Age. And then much more recently, we started to construct steel and glass, aluminum, and uh, many other materials that you see around you. I'm going to end by asking you to imagine what would a world look like where you can order any desired material or drug on demand. Thank you very much.